<laughs> okay, uh, welcome back to the Minding Emotions uh, podcast, and uh, we're happy to be uh, continuing the conversation. Um, I think we're up to, is this our, like our fifth conversation, Rami? I believe so. Yeah, I think we're on our fifth conversation. So uh, if, you've, uh, if this is your first um, encounter with us, uh, please uh, feel free to go back and get some of the other conversations about uh, the emotions that we've had. But this will also be a standalone episode. Um, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is uh, Stephen Asma, and I'm a professor of philosophy at Columbia College in Chicago, and also a founding uh, fellow of the research group in mind, science, and culture. And I'm Rami Gabriel, um, a uh, associate professor of psychology at Columbia College Chicago, and also a founding member of the research group in mind, science, and culture. Great. And so we thought we'd uh, divide this conversation up into sort of two major sections, uh, the first of which we're going to be talking about the whether or not emotions are uh, socially constructed or cognitively constructed um, versus the idea that they, they sort of originate, um, sort of preset uh, within the brain and body. Uh, and we'll, we'll have that conversation for the, maybe the first half, and then we'd also like to uh, discuss a great uh, memorial conference uh, workshop uh, in honor of uh, the great uh, effective neuroscientist uh, Jak Pangsep, who passed away last year, and that was an amazing uh, collection of uh, intellectuals, uh, uh, scholars, researchers, all doing work on the emotions, and so we thought we'd share some highlights from, from that uh, conference just to give people some additional ideas to go and, and uh, dig into more deeply. So, all right, then without further ado, let's take a look at this idea. We've mentioned it before in our conversations, but uh, this is the time to really uh, focus on it. There is a new book, uh, came out in 2017 by uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, and uh, the name of, the, of her book is, uh, well, where is it now? Um, what is it? How Emotions Are Made. And it's gotten a lot of press, and it's become very popular. And she's done TED Talks. And, uh, of course, we've been interacting with her work for, uh, for a while now, reading the more sort of uh, specialized papers and so forth. But she has a popular theory of emotions, which um, is called the conceptual act theory. And this is uh, we're going to try to sketch what her theory is and then offer some sort of analysis, some criticism. Uh, but basically her view is that um, the emotions are things that we are constructing in our mind and uh, by the sort of contextual situation that we're in, and that in a sense um, they're not these sort of instinctual preset uh, patterns in the brain, but they're more like... Um, sort of relative constructions that happen sort of in real time. So one of her examples uh, that she gives is uh, you might feel some kind of physical changes within the body, you know, when you're, you know, entering a bakery. Um, but it's your mind, in a sense, and the social situation of the bakery that helps you interpret this as a kind of uh, desire for baked goods. And so it's a it's ultimately a kind of positive experience, and your uh, conceptual uh, sort of linguistic mind is shaping this together with the, the event that you find yourself in, the situation that you find yourself in. The same sort of physiological upset, maybe uh, you're feeling queasy or uh, something's going on at the affective core level, could be interpreted very differently if you're sitting in the hospital waiting room uh, trying to find out about, you know, what's the condition of a loved one. And Barrett's view is that from the biological point of view, it's the same kind of um, physiological change within the body and brain, but the meaning of that change is something that we cognitively bring to each experience. And that is sort of part of the conceptual thinking about the situation we're in and the actual environment that we're, we happen to be in at that moment, the hospital waiting room versus a bakery. So do you have anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I would just of... add, um, 
uh, in terms of sort of the history of this theory, I think there's a couple of strands. There's a um, there's a famous one you're mentioning here about how the context determines the appraisal of the yeah. situation. And the famous paper is 1962, Daniel Schachter and uh, Schifrin uh, paper where they injected people with um, um, adrenaline, I believe it was. And they turned on their sympathetic nervous system. And they put them in uh, one of two situations. One where they're with a, uh, a confederate of the... Uh, of the experiment, who is uh, acting ebullient, uh, and another situation where the confederate is acting um, angry and depressed, and then they test after what what emotion are you going through, and they tend they tend to be sculpted by the situation they were in, and that paper, uh, the authors concluded that the subjects all have the same physiological arousal, but the way that they interpret the emotion is, is dependent upon the situation they're in. Therefore, the appraisal of the situation um, is the determinant of the emotion. Uh, and that's a very um, important paper and a very important um, sort of extension to the older debate, which is the um, William James Lang, uh, and William James and Lang as theory versus the Canon theory, which is how much of an emotion is physiological. Is the physiology first or is the emotion first and what are the relationship between the two? So there's that whole strand in psychology. And um, I would also um, conjecture that the sort of postmodern um, movement in the last 30 years, which wanted to deconstruct uh, our uh, cultural terms uh, and the hege hegemonic... Uh, narratives uh, of dominant cultural, um, um, you know, power bodies, basically. Uh, it does, I, I do think that, for example, Catherine Lutz is someone who we've read on emotions, talking about how emotions are cultural constructs. And then we can go back to Foucault, uh, Michel Foucault, who in a various, in a large, a large body of work, talks about how, um, it's the people in power who determine the meaning of various terms. Uh, and they do that through their hold on power. Uh, and that the terms or the way we talk about things is not natural, but rather a uh, consequence um, uh, of uh, cultural, basically, um, appraisal. Uh, so I would that's a that's a long complicated field, but basically I think that there's something from that that this that these authors are referring to with a social with the idea of cultural construction, and then I also think there's something in psychology that they're referring to, which is these uh, earlier um, papers. Yeah, that's actually that's very helpful because then you see that. Uh there are these uh, historical antecedents to Barrett's view, um, some of which I think she explicitly acknowledges, and some of which I think you're right have just shaped a, a larger, you know, zeitgeist about constructionism. So, for example, she does acknowledge, I believe, the, the work by Catherine Lutz, the anthropologist mm -hmm. who you mentioned, mm -hmm. sort of famously said, "Well." every culture has a different set of emotions. You don't have universal natural kinds of anger or sadness. The culture basically defines what uh, is an emotion, and there are some cultures, according to Lutz, that uh, don't have anger, for, let's say. Um, and so it's not, it's, it's not just that there is a difference in how the emotions are expressed, it's a more radical claim that there is no underlying emotions that are universal. Then I think you're right that this connection to Foucault and the, the larger conversation about constructionism, I think, is really at work here, too. Um, I don't know how much of this Barrett is, you know, uh, able to see in her own work or acknowledge, but it's pretty clear that we're, after sort of Foucault opened the door on this, we had some ideas about the famous uh, sapir Whorf thesis about language. Uh, you look at Eskimos or Inuit's language for snow, it's incredibly rich and detailed compared to our words for snow. 
So in a sense, maybe when language is different, then the underlying reality is different. This is sort of one of the theses that you could uh, you could find among social constructionists. And so I think her view is also a little bit like this, that there's a sense in which the social world is defining what is anger, what is sadness, when can you feel it, when should you not feel it. On the other hand, uh, Barrett wants to have her cake and eat it too because she doesn't want to say that uh, society just defines this stuff um, in a kind of radical relativism. She thinks that your mind is deciding whether you're angry or whether you're sad it, in a way, in the same sort of almost automatic, very fast way that your perceptions are processing uh, information. So she thinks that you're conceptualizing, hey, I'm angry now, is sort of like you're like I'm seeing the wall over here and it's a blue wall. She thinks mm -hmm. that your brain is just automatically categorizing and processing this stuff without sort of self-conscious inferences. And so here's a place where I think she wants to have it both ways. She thinks it's constructed, um, but it's also strangely <laughs> automatic and, and almost modular in a way. So this is a problem. Right. And this, so this is also, there's a history of this in psychology, the idea of the unconscious emotion, the idea of automatic behaviors, the idea of unconscious behaviors. That's also been very popular in the last 50 years. So I can see, you know, there's only certain tools that we have in psychology that are still in mind for people who are not also reading in, in, the, in the larger world of philosophy, philosophy of mind. So I think that, that that's being taken up too of this, this the given. Yeah, the datum. Uh, the datum, and I think I think it's um, a little problematic in this case, because uh, one hears on on one hand the idea that these are cultural and these are you know we're trained to do these and language gives us these concepts. And on the other hand, we want to hear that oh, it's just given like that. Um, we could look at a sort of a behavioral version of that. Yeah, we're trained. There's behavioral learning that makes us see this or that. But uh, I think it's it's problematic if we want to give so much power to culture, then we also have to understand that culture is happening at a high level. Uh, and if we want to say that culture can be trained down to these behavioral levels, um, we might be confusing the way we talk about things with the way uh, the body is expressing. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right, and I think there, I think the confusion here is actually in. Barrett's thesis. It's in the conceptual act theory because, like you said, what is the way, and she, she says this too, you know, the, how do you actually do this conceptualizing of your experience? Well, just like um, other human conceptual abilities, it's in, it seems very closely tied to language. How does your language allow you to classify, you know, um, all, all this stuff as water or all these things as glasses, it, language helps us you know, create these kind of categories, and then you have instances that fit within those categories. And in her book, she actually argues, well, since um, animals have rudimentary uh, language and uh, babies don't have language yet, their ability to have these emotions that we recognize is very doubtful, she thinks. Now, that is sort of taking the construction line pretty clearly, uh, that language creates concepts, and concepts help you shape your inner life. But then the other side is this thing you were talking about of, well, we recognize that there's all kinds of unconscious emotions, or there's kind of stuff that's happening in an automatic way in the mind, like perception, and that stuff is not as, um, how, do I, how do I say this? It's, it's not being sort of categorized by language per se. It's part more of the biology of mm -hmm. how the mind works. And as we've talked about many times in the past, um, there is this whole other tradition which Barrett does not like, and that is the idea that there is a kind of uh, brain pathway for anger, and there's a specific brain pathway for lust, and there's a specific brain pathway for fear, and 
Barrett doesn't want any of that stuff. Which brings us to the next question I'd like to ask, which is, what what do we make of, the, of this claim that uh, she seems to think none of the neuroscience of, of brain circuitry is is compelling or or legit? Yeah, um, I find uh, that part of the argument very uh, um, tenuous. Uh, namely, there's this claim that, well, because we're labeling it, that's what the emotion is, is at that level. But of course, that means, well, you know there's a physiological arousal coming, and she, she wouldn't deny that. You can't deny it. But her, the idea that's being put forward is that, well, you can't read that on anyone else, and it's not universal. So this is already a uh, a large claim, which I don't think is backed up. I mean, from my understanding, and I've been to conferences uh, where she's presented. The claim is that she has done, and there's a p paper published, a, a meta-analysis of all these papers on emotions. And when she did that, it turned out her and her lab did that. That no, there's nothing. There's nothing clear in all of it. There's no like, this is a, this is this. This is that. This is anger, this is fear. Now, of course, there's a lot of, that's that's probably not the best way to find out if the concepts we've put forward are, are real. Because, as we all know, there's validity questions and reliability questions, inter-reliability questions uh, between psychology experiments. They've been done in different places, they've used language differently. They've, there's all kinds of um, factors that meta-analysis um, while it's really nice to have an articles of a review article about something, we uh, definitely, um, on certain questions, we probably sh don't think, better analysis is probably not the best tool, especially if what we're looking at is the plurality of cultural constructions and linguistic constructions. Because anyone who's taking class on emotions will, or looking into it will see that there's a large number of theories. Even for the idea that there are these brain pathways there's, you know, several versions of what that could look like. And then in the cultural field, there's several versions of what that could look like. So uh, just because uh, theories don't agree doesn't mean that there's not something underneath. We can think about the quantum, the initial quantum mechanics interpretations with the Copenhagen and Heisenberg. and mm. These people mm. were, were, were looking at something that was real, but they couldn't figure it out. And some people argue they never figured it out. But that doesn't mean that the phenomenon wasn't there and that there weren't more cogent versions from the plurality of theories. That's, that's part of this idea of Foucault and power that I think I, we should bring in here is that, well, wh why, do some theory, why are some theories popular sometimes? Why is this book popular and this other book we talked about last time, the Pessoa, mm -hmm. uh, only, only for specialists? What's... What's the hold on power that certain ideas, like this idea that it's a cultural construction, why is that more popular? Yeah, I, no, that's a great point. I mean, if you look at the, uh, what else is happening in our own, like, larger culture, you'll find that there are sort of l large scale socio political interests in uh, social constructionism that have to do, for example, with gender and race. Uh, and we can't ignore that that's a fairly uh, fraught and, and popular conversation that's being held, which is to what extent um, is gender, for example, uh, a social construction versus a biological um, status. And the view among biologists is uh, that sex is biological and that sex actually has causal role to play in gender traits. So there's a fair amount of gender that's also biologically um, <clears throat> sort of uh, con constitutive. Uh, on the other hand, in the social sciences and in the humanities, the assumption is that, well, maybe sex is biological, but that's a big maybe for some people. But certainly gender is socially constructed. And the same is even being argued with regard to race. How much biology is there in, re in race? And how much of it is part of, uh, you know, social institutions? How much of it is part of a political uh, narrative that's happened uh, historically? So you can see that thinking of the emotions as social construction is sort of um, part of this larger conversation that's happening in the culture. Yeah, I, I would just 
point out, since we're talking about popularity, that the other most popular philosopher in the world right now, or on the on the bestseller list, is this guy Jordan Peterson. Oh yeah, that's right. This Canadian, and um, and what's going on here is that he is arguing uh, a lot about this gender language. He's talking about mm-hmm. how do we, that's how right. come we have all these fights at this culture level, and this is the biology, and here's the culture, and he's arguing up at this level, and it looks like this Barrett book is arguing up at this level about what do we do about this biology that's coming up. So it really seems like the popular thing going on now is how do we decipher and entrench uh, biological findings into our cultural sphere in a way that maintains sort of liberalism um, for our behaviors, beliefs, the lives we lead, um, uh, while taking on... uh, scientific values of this is empiricism this is how it works and this is true this is real you, you see and, and the question for many i think is is what tr- which one which one um which one is more important no that i i agree with you and there's a uh, there's a sense in which um if you like you said the jordan peterson material seems to be uh, it's operating more at a at a cultural level, although he seems to have quite a bit of respect for the biological. But mm-hmm. there is something about all of this stuff which yeah, I think you, I'd like you to talk about and address, namely the sort of self help literature, mm-hmm. which is in a way saying you can make your destiny. Uh, in fact, Barrett says this in in the book. She says it, and also in her TED talk, she says you decide what your emotions will be. You can in a sense, have agency over your emotional life. And I think there's something very attractive to people about that because it, they feel like it's empowering for them. And if you just give them the straight, the straight biology, they feel like, oh, it's a deterministic world and I'm, you know, I'm basically the, the puppet of these forces that I don't have any control over. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that's a, a naive view of the biology, actually, uh, because th- that's a kind of biology from... 50 years ago. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that's the cultural tension that you're talking about. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the self-help psychology tradition and whether you see Barrett, you know, it, in this tradition. Well, in fact, I do. I mean, uh, when I hear someone say, it's up to you, or there are millions of neurons, you know, <laughs> bursting in your head. I mean, that's just not that's just not the way that that I've heard people talk about things in psychology departments and psychology papers. It is the way, uh, on the other hand, that I've heard it spoke. I've heard the brain or the mind spoken about in self help, and I have read uh, several of these, and I wrote an article about this. And that's the same language. Like it really cued me off when I when I heard that in in, in some of her work, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so popular because. It's really great to hear stuff like that. It's also really great to hear some, taking down, you know, the biology. Taking down biology is also very, very popular. Um, and, and interestingly enough, we should mention that Jordan Peterson just wrote a self-help book, 12 Steps of Life or something like that. Something, yeah. Something like that. So um, I have to, if we can take the social cultural stuff into this, we have to consider that if you're going to write a book that more than – you know, ten thousand people read, then it better have it better have something sexy in there. <laughs> you know, and that yeah. sexy thing should be either empowering, uh, easy to relate to, uh, or um, or taking down something that you don't want to read. Like, oh, I don't want to read all that, you know, neuroscience crap. Someone tell me it's not true. That that's the vibe I get. Um, not to say that there are other ideas that are not worth considering but that's that's there yeah i don't think we can deny it i don't think we can deny that when a million people read something there's got to be there's got to be some comfortable truths in it yeah it's got to be uh speaking to some need they're having at at that time in the culture and so let's um you know i one of the things i i think um i'd say about this constructivist view whether it's Barrett or, or, or another person, is that it is good at describing a certain level 
of our emotional lives, like like going into a bakery, you know, um, there's a sense in which there's a kind of, uh, you know, I think of the mind, I think you do it too, as, as sort of layers of, of um, mechanisms and of abilities or powers. And that we know that in a sense, uh, I can think about rather abstract emotions. We've talked about this before, like existential ennui, or just, you know, these interesting exper experiences where you're just uh, looking at, uh, you know, the Japanese have this idea of wabi-sabi or mano no aware, which is like, you look at a, a broken teacup mm -hmm. and you, in a sense, you have this feeling that all things are impermanent and there's a kind of Buddhist enrichment of that feeling when you're sort of looking at this tea mug. And so I, I think in a way, the constructivists ha are really good at articulating how emotions or feelings are wrapped up in uh, concepts and ideas. And I think that's a large part of our emotional lives. But I think as soon as you get out of that rarefied cloud land, or, or that, it's not a cloud land, it's real, but as soon as you get out of that rarefied domain, um, and into sort of more powerful experiences, I think that's where the natural kind theorists, uh, the instinctive uh, emotions, are much more compelling. And here's where I think uh, Barrett, maybe in order to be controversial, has discounted the role of things like um, fear and, and anger as really sort of automatic responses to experiences. One quick contrast with Barrett, um, a philosopher who I think has done a, a much better job with this material is Martha Nussbaum. Mm, yeah. And Martha Nussbaum describes the way in which, and, and she's very much uh, in that sort of stoic tradition um, that the mind, that concepts are shaping our feelings or interpreting our feelings and, and sort of assenting or, or saying no to them. But she describes, you know, uh, the death of her mother uh, famously uh, as being an upheaval of thought, like something just crashes into your cognitive thinking and your life and turns it upside down. And it's gut wrenching. And it's not something you, uh, there is a cognitive element, but it's also an extremely powerful physiological bodily experience that then you've got a process. So I think for me, the, the problem here with uh, the constructivists is that they're, they're taking a layer of emotional life um, and they're basically extrapolating it all the way down. Uh, and then they don't know what to do with these, deep, these more intense emotions that we share with uh, all, all mammals. Yeah, I think one of the, the claims they're making is that we don't share, we don't even share things with mammals, we don't even share things with each other. And uh, this is this is one of the really disturbing claims that that she makes is, look you know look at another person you can't tell what they're really thinking, mm. and I think that's I just I think that's that's um, I think that's incorrect. Uh, mm. um, I was just speaking with a friend whose pet died, and he was he was he was beside him beside himself really because he felt he could he could share so he shared so much in this emotional bond with the animal and could see eye to eye with the animal in many ways emotionally and i think that any pet owner i'm not a pet owner but it's it's i think it's pretty obvious any pet owner has some is sharing an emotional bond with the animal they're definitely not talking right they're sharing something yeah uh, and i think it's it's silly uh, maybe i just don't understand why you I just don't think it's. I just, it doesn't seem true based on uh, that phenomenology, phenomenology of the animal and, and human relationship. Of course, the human relationships are based on these mutual understandings of uh, emotion, expression, emotion, mm -hmm. reaction, um, value system towards the world. You know, we seeing eye to eye on all these kinds of things, reading micro expressions, these kind of things. That seems to be what our relationships are built on. So. So this this sort of claim that we can't read it's all is being made up by these cultural narratives to me is completely absurd actually okay. <laughs> in, in regards to, yeah. to to the emotional bonds we make with each other and with animals. No, that I, that's a great point because you're uh, what I think 
people are doing what what she's doing when she says, "Oh, look, you can hide your emotion from somebody." Is you're taking really an exception, which is human deception, <laughs> uh, and you're using it now as the rule, which is, "Oh, people's faces and their bodies are indecipherable." When I think the point you're making is, no, actually, the the shared system we have as human beings is in many ways based on our ability to read body language, these micro expressions. Um, and it's all pre-linguistic. It's also, mm. I think, pre-conceptual. I think it really is, you know, bodies, especially mam mammal bodies are very good at reading other bodies, other mammal bodies. And this is part of the shared emotional um, sort of continuum that we have with other animals, like you're saying. And another argument uh, on the side that we actually are sharing things, uh, for example, we're, you were talking about uh, some Japanese concepts, or aesthetic concepts, and I'm uh, reading a Chinese tongue poet, mm. Wang Wei. Yeah. And I'm reading him, and I'm reading the translation. I've read several translations, and I'm comparing, and I'm still connecting with, with these poems. This is a person who lived over a thousand years ago, Right. How am I still connecting? That that says that that culture is not the to the complete determinant of the emotional thing. We're, we, many of us are reading, you know, uh, novels from the 19th century. We listen to music from different countries, and things get across. Why are things getting across if it's all this sort of? Mm. Well, I don't even know what this person's thinking. I don't even know what Wang Wei is saying. <laughs> right. that says yeah. that that the uh, the mountain is empty. What could he possibly <laughs> mean? You know, he's describing the bird. What? Why would he do that? I have no idea. You know, that th that doesn't occur to me. I don't read poetry from other time periods or d d other cultures and think I have no idea what's going on. Mm. I read it precisely because I actually feel what's going on. Um, a lot of that's determined by the 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 amount of knowledge I've brought to it, such that I can take things out and the patience I have in that interchange. But the interchange is very rich, like you're saying. That's probably one of the reasons they're focusing on this is that it's so rich, and we could say that everything is happening in there, but but we'd be missing something. Yeah, no, that's a great uh, that's a great point. I mean, I hadn't thought about that in particular. I'm thinking here more about the music you mentioned because as as a non linguistic form of a communication mm -hmm. or expression, it seems like an even clearer case in which. Um, I can be exposed to a music form which I have no cultural predecessor for or analog for. Uh, I mean, can I remember? I can remember the first time actually that I heard um, Indian classical music when I was mm. young. I think I was, uh, you know, in uh, junior high school, and it it did uh, connect to me in a very uh, powerful way. And I had really no way to understand <laughs> what it was doing, but it I got the emotional impact of the raga or whatever it was I was hearing at that at that moment. And then it set me down this path of exploring it and enriching it with all the sort of cognitive and historical learning. So mm -hmm. I like this idea as a counter argument in a way. How is it that uh, cross-cultural stuff, and I mean sort of stuff that you haven't experienced before, still has emotional impact? The only way it can is if there's something in you uh, that resonates um, at a precognitive, preconceptual, and almost in a pre-situational uh, way, um, in order for you to be able to get that that content. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I guess I'm inclined to think like, let me connect it to expl an explicit objection I have to the Barrett thesis, which is her claim is that you're in a way, you take her two examples of going into a bakery versus sitting in a waiting room at a at a hospital. She says there's a kind of physiological arousal, which you're right. She would acknowledge all of us are having some physiological state at all times. It's somewhere on the va valence, you know, continuum of positive and negative, and then the situation basically in interprets it. But the the problem with the theory is, and here's why it doesn't seem very fruitful to me, is she doesn't really have a way of explaining what the differences are in that core uh, physiological state. Like, why is it sometimes negative and, uh, and intense? Why is it sometimes negative and, you know, 
you know, a relatively low volume? Why is it sometimes positive and low volume? In other words, why is the body reacting in the way it does uh, at this core level before you start layering on the concepts? And as far yeah. as I can tell, she has no explanation for that. Well, I think uh, there might, she might have some... Uh, I believe that her mentor was James Russell, who came oh. up with the idea of core affect. Okay. And core affect is this basically... Um, it's kind of like Wundt. Wundt yeah. uh, uh, Wilhelm Wundt in 1879 opened the first psychology lab in Leipzig. And one of his theories was <clears throat> that there's these three categories, these three... Um, qualities of emotion. One is the valence, and one is uh, arousal. And then he had another one, which I forgot, tone or something, or brevity or whatever. So the core affect thing is based on that, that you can be positive or negative, and you can be aroused or unaroused, and then you have this whole sphere, and you can place any emotion on that. Uh, and it is it is an interesting theory, and the question is, so, so I think what, what uh, Barrett and Russell and that school are saying that all em emotions are just something on that, on that sphere. That's all they are. And that anything above that is cultural... Um, uh, interpretation. Interpretation. Sorry. Anything outside there is cultural interpretation. Now, now that that that's, makes some sense. Um, and the question is how differentiated is that that sphere, but but I think what the the idea that that Panksepp and some of these other people who've really looking at emotions as these uh, brain systems have given to that or have used to to refine that is that your state depends upon your body's regulation vis-a-vis -vis the environment, namely your body has homeostatic needs. And your and your homeostatic needs are tracing the body and the environment, and then, based on that, they have some sort of place on the sphere. That to me, that to me brings it together, brings the body into it, and I would also add the uh, the Panksepp idea of seeking, that the the organism is inherently um, uh, motivated to engage with the world relative to their bodily state uh, within a, a particular environment. Yeah, that makes sense, and that's helpful. I still have some... I, I guess the way I see it, then, is that there's maybe a difference between the constructivist and the nativist. And here I'm talking about Bear as a constructivist and people like Panksepp and Damasio as uh, Ledoux, to a certain extent, as nativists. Maybe the difference between the major difference is that they differ about what is what is the force or mechanism that is getting the organism to have an adaptive relationship with its environment. And mm -hmm. for constructivists, it's got to be the cognitive mind that's getting you to see that fear is the proper response because this guy's coming at you in a dark alley. So fear, running away is a behavior that would be adaptive to this particular environment. So you need cognition or concepts in order to adapt the feeling you're having to the situation. Now, I'm not sympathetic to that view because it seems to me we've already got a, an operating system that's adapted to the environment. And, and it has this ancient connection with our phylogenetic history such that all I have to do is see this this person coming at me and this fear circuit in the brain is activated and the behaviors respond. So what's making my, experience, my uh, behavior adaptive in this context of a threat is the, is the brain-based affective system that uh, people like um, Barrage and Panksepp have isolated within the brain. And so that's the, one of the major differences is what makes the feeling adaptive. Yeah, and I would say what makes the feeling adaptive is the behavioral response that is connected to the affective response. Right. So the, the affective response is a sort of tracing what the organism, the organism relative to the environment is going through. And then that is directly connected to some sort of behavior. So fear doesn't fear means the feeling, but it also means 
a certain sympathetic arousal, and it means a certain proclivity to a behavior, dispositions to behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, there's that seems to me that's missing from the... If we're talking about emotions as these cognitive things, yeah, we're thinking, we're talking, we're doing all this stuff. That seems to be another sphere that's very rarefied, and it's probably not what it's definitely not what animals are doing. They're not right. sitting around considering emotions. Right. Emotions are tools within a behavioral matrix that um, is adaptive, as you said. Right. And I guess um, maybe just uh, I have sort of just one last point on this, and then we can we can move on to this discussion, perhaps um, of the uh, conference. Um, the, I guess for me conceptually, there's a there's a tension between what uh, some of the construct constructivists are doing, and particularly Barrett wants to say on the one hand that um, my emotions are constructed for me by the brain, just like my perception is constructed for me. Um, but then right away she turns around and wants to say my emotions are constructed by me. And I guess that's the tension that I think is very interesting here, which is um, unless you have some additional theory to explain how these two are working together, you can't have it both ways. Or if you have it both ways, it has to be better articulated. So I think she says, well, your emotions are, are uh, constructed for you by the brain um, when she wants to talk about something that's non-negotiable and happens quickly and automatically. But she switches to the emotions are constructed by me when she wants to talk about uh, I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to I'm not going to be give in to these tendencies I have, or I'm going to get better habits. Or, and I guess this one interesting issue here is you know, is it a is it a responsible uh, thesis to suggest that you can, in a sense, change your emotional life? Things like depression, for example. Uh, it, it worries me that the suggestion here is that you could just sort of take that by the, by the conceptual hand and shake it around and rebuild depression so that you were, you know, you weren't depressed. And I, I find that, uh, I, she doesn't say this directly, but it seems to be implied in this idea that you are in control of your emotions. And I, it seems a little, um, I, I want to say dangerous maybe. Yeah, I would echo that and say that, uh, for people who are clinically depressed or clinically anxious or, or have bipolar or have schizophrenia, I think that uh, they would find this abhorrent. I think they would find this, this is, it's, it's, um, it's completely out of their control because of the, the, the way that these sort of emotional circuits were developmentally de um, con uh, sort of shaped over time and they have no control over those things. Uh, and I'll say, I'll say this. I think agency sells books. Mm. And from reading a lot of self-help, uh, what I saw is the, the self-help books really were pitching control of the mind, mm. control over the mind. And it could be in this sort of idealistic fashion of the secret where you put your idea out there and the world takes it and whatever. Or it could be in these uh, um, Dale Carnegie or this sort of seven habits where you can control, you can be really efficient like a great capitalist machine and you can organize everything and if you do that, you can meet friends and you can, you can get work done. All this stuff is that, yeah, you can control all these things and here's the way to do it. <laughs> yeah, why is, everything a, why is everything a list? Everything's like seven ways to do, ten th ways that you can, it's, yeah. almost, it's, kind of, it's really quite a genre. It is quite a genre, and, it, and it's actually it's a very popular. It's far more popular than anything yeah, that, that it makes that, money that um, scientists and uh, philosophers are, are doing, um, or poets. Um, but um, yeah, I would I would echo what you're saying that I think it's I think it's I think it's irresponsible to to try to give people the notion that they have so much control because agency is very much I think part of our individualist mindset our individualist relationship to the world within an existentialist kind of um paradigm mm. Mm. uh sort of i think it's a i think it's another bourgeois concept in fact okay okay all right that's a, that's let's that's a strong way to end that part of the conversation um let's talk a little bit now um 
about this uh, fantastic uh, conference that, that we went to uh, yeah. in Washington State University. And I think a lot of listeners and viewers would be would really love this stuff because there was so much rich material. Uh, maybe we can just do kind of a, a highlights tour of the stuff. Oh, good. That's really helpful. Um, the Memorial Symposium, uh, Yak Pangsep, that was in April. And there were a lot of heavy hitters there. Uh, Great people, hosts. Very nice hosts. Yes. Uh, and Yak's uh, wife... Anissa and Yak's son, uh, his son Jules is a, an excellent uh, neuroscientist in his own right, uh, was sharing some of his uh, own research with us and uh, some, some great uh, biologists uh, there. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we start with you and uh, maybe you just want to pick out one of the talks and, and talk a little bit about what, uh, you know, the significance of it. Um, sure, I could... Um talk a little bit here um, there were several talks it was interesting we got to hear some uh, it, it was sort of like a uh, okay what did each of uh, uh, Yak's students uh, go on to do or or what what are the consequences of his you know 40 years of work uh, and we heard some interesting things we heard a great talk for example if you just go from the beginning we heard this talk about oxytocin mm and about um, all the work that's been done subsequently about how does it work and what exactly is it. Is it a, a bonding um, molecule? The, uh, what, is it, uh, how, how do, what, is, what is the purpose of bonding? How is it related to maternal bonding versus other kinds of bonding? And I think that's something that you've, you've, you've thought a lot yeah. about. No, I think that that, that was an exciting uh, paper. Is this the one by Larry Young that you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. For for listeners, uh, Larry Young, uh, I can't remember where he's at. Emory. He's Emory. at Emory, and he's done some amazing work with uh, prairie voles. Right? Are they prairie right. voles? Prairie voles. Yeah, <clears throat> these are uh, small, um, uh, you know, creatures that, uh, like human beings, do sort of monogamous pair bonding. And so he's done a lot of study of the uh, oxytocin system. In those animals, and uh, he's also written a fairly interesting book um, about uh, love and relationships and chemistry, and just you know, uh, really pursuant to our the conversation we were just having, his view is that um, we've done way too much social constructing of gender and love, and we should look more at the biology because. And he looks at some amazing cases there, like uh, these Mahimbras from uh, the Dominican Republic, I believe, who are born as girls, but then around age 12, they become boys. And it's fascinating uh, work there. So I, I recommend people go and look at that because he's talking about the, the biology of sex and gender. But the paper we saw, he was talking about uh, oxytocin and pair bonding. And yeah, it's true that the original idea was that it was a kind of the love hormone and like you when you're hugging, you know, your lover or a family member, the oxytocin rises. And I, and there's lots of evidence that that's true. But what I thought was interesting was he said, um, oxytocin is more like, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but he said it's more like a, a salience enhancer. Mm -hmm. That it, it can be, if you're, if you're having positive affect, the oxytocin turns it up. But if you're having some negative affect, it can also turn that up as well. And that, you know, I'm not going to, I won't do it justice by articulating all the data and stuff, but I think that was an exciting uh, discussion. And uh, he had some great examples, too, about uh, male and female preferences in mates. So that was, that was a fun one. One of the other ones that I thought was really uh, powerful was, uh, I think, uh, Mark Solms. Yeah, from, um, from University of Cape Town. Yeah. So he, he flew in from South Africa, and he's, uh, maybe some of the listeners will know that he's uh, a very, um, he's, didn't he sort of define, like, the, the, the connection between psychoanalysis and brain science? Isn't he sort of the major yeah. proponent of connecting these two? Mm -hmm. um, and he gave a very powerful talk about, um, you know, the influence of Pangsep's ideas uh, on psychoanalysis, psychology. Uh, but one of the things that I thought was really exciting was he said, uh, he started out by talking about the hard problem. Of consciousness. Yeah, the hard problem of consciousness. So maybe we should just sort of 
trot out what the hard problem is and then offer what his solution is. Do you, do you want to do it or should I? What, what, how do you want to do it? I'll do one part of it. Okay. The hard problem of consciousness uh, as formulated by David Chalmers, I think 1996 or something like that, was that um, uh, how is it that this physical thing, this physical body also has a subjective aspect? How, how come there's something it's like? in addition to just these reactions and this, these physical manifestations. The hard problem is how is a physical thing also a mental or subjective or uh, sentient thing? Yeah. And we, we have all this data on how the brain processes perception and how it processes um, changes uh, within the body, like these homeostatic changes. But uh, according to the sort of Chalmers, uh, David Chalmers picture, that stuff's all the easy problem, right? Mm. And so the, the hard problem is how is it that this particular brain pattern actually, like you said, uh, feels like um, joy or, or see, uh, appears like blue? That is the subjective aspect of all this brain activity. And I guess Chalmers is an interesting case because I think early on he had a uh, either a direct or indirect uh, um, influence on the on rekindling dualism, which sort right. of came back in a, with a furor in the '90s and the early aughts, and it's still alive and well, of course. But I think in more recent years he seems to have edged over towards a, a panpsychism to solve this problem, which I think is interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting, yeah. That's that's having a little heyday right now. It is panpsych. This is the time for panpsychism. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in graduate school, uh, somebody telling me they were panpsychist, and I remember laughing in their face, <laughs> which which shows you, which is <laughs> which reveals a certain level of uh, pompous. Uh, <laughs> Inexperience on my part because I'm, I'm not proud of that moment. I, I do think panpsychism is not uh, does not really warrant uh, laughter in your face, uh, but, but it's, it's certainly a, it's certainly still a minority position. I, I should clarify this maybe. It's the idea that um, well, if you can't find consciousness, uh, you know, in the human mind. Um, it, that uh, in a sense we have these problems with when does it emerge? You know. If you get certain sorts of neural patterns together, does consciousness just pop up like a miracle? And so many people consider that to be a problem with emergence theory. So in order to avoid that problem, they'll say, well, maybe there's just always a little bit of consciousness in everything, and it simply accumulates in, in, into these rather significant cases, like in the human mind. But in a sense, panpsychism says, well, there's also a kind of very rudimentary consciousness in in this stuff, all too. Things, yeah. All living things. Yeah. So one of the things that happened, in, I think, in this uh, Mark Solms uh, piece was he said that he thought that um, um, Yak Pengsep's affective systems had, e- in effect, solved the hard problem, which is a really bold claim, you know. And his, it, his claim is just that uh, the, what, what it's like to be conscious is not to have a conceptual mind, but it's the ability to feel pain or pleasure. And that it, it's having a nervous system that gives you uh, sentience. It gives you uh, subjectivity. Yep, and it's also a way of solving the issue of what is the function of consciousness, which has been a real, a real big question, which is what's the point if we have all these reactions and stuff like that? It must be an epiphenomena, something that exists but has no causal, um, uh, causal effects. Uh, and... Uh, I actually recall this from seeing a talk at going to a uh, consciousness conference in maybe 2002 or something like that, 2003, and hearing hearing this idea that maybe instead of conscious thinking about consciousness at this sort of high level about, well, how can we have these thoughts, how can we have language, how can we be constructing all this stuff, to thinking of consciousness at this very low level, which is what other animals presumably have, non-linguistic animals, which is consciousness is a way of feeling things. Its, its function stems more from emotion than from cognitive thought and uh, um, and these sort of transcendental experiences we have. You know, we think of consciousness like, 
oh, I'm, it's actually interesting to think about this. The, the Cartesian thing is all about this really high level of doubt and um, um, that conceptual idea of doubt, you mm-hmm. know, that, that's, that's complicated. I doubt that this is real. Yeah. I mean, that's very, that's very, very complicated. Um, whereas you can think of this more pure consciousness view that I'm conscious because there's a sort of basic hum, the om, you know, kind of hum that I'm experiencing. Uh, that's a very basic thing, and that's probably non-linguistic and closer to sort of an affective tone. Mm-hmm. And, and contrasting those two, and sort of the Western tradition is always talking about this, and I think that uh, when I heard this kind of work, uh, these ideas that Solms is, 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 is discussing, uh, I realized that down there is where probably where the, the answer is for this hard question rather than up here. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I think maybe we should uh, dedicate maybe a whole conversation to that uh, sometime in the future because it, it would yeah. take a lot of work to unpack it entirely. But I do think we're in agreement that um, philosophers at least, <clears throat> and I think to some extent psychologists too, but certainly philosophers have been really focused <clears throat> in the wrong direction, uh, I, I think, on this on what sentience is or what what counts as consciousness or when you have consciousness. And it's not just philosophers. We've talked before about um, even some really uh, important psychologists like uh, um, like Joseph Ledoux has also, I think, been um, entranced by this idea that you must have to get these raw feelings into uh, um, some kind of conceptual higher, co- order. higher order awareness for it to qualify uh, as consciousness. And I think that's the wrong uh, direction to go in. We've got to go down low, but then it, I asked Psalms at the meeting, how low do we go? You know, do mm-hmm. we go the panpsychism route, uh, or is there some place on the phylogenetic tree where this kind of um, uh, reality emerged? And mm-hmm. his response was that he thought it was... Um, uh, that it was certainly in the mammalian clade, that it would go down through the vertebrate clade, and that uh, he basically said something like, if you've got a nervous system, then you've got subjectivity. You've got, um, you've got what it's like to be that organism. And so that basically goes well into um, you know, the phylogenetic tree or bush, if you like, you know, uh, but it, it does make sense that there would be certain kinds of animals that would not need uh, sentience, namely animals that don't move much. Um, although even there, f- you'd have to look at the feeding mechanisms, for example. Filter feeders mm-hmm. really don't need to have consciousness or feelings per se, I suspect. There doesn't seem to be any selective pressure for them to acquire uh, those kinds of abilities. And so anyway, I thought that was an exciting uh, discussion. Yeah, bringing together uh, notions of evolution, notions of consciousness, uh, and um, of course uh, emotions. Emotions as as functional, which in our cultural language, if we want to get back to that high level, th- their emotions are like, well, you either have these love, romantic love things, or emotions are a problem. Yeah. Your ang- your anxiety, you're depressed. Anxiety and depression are probably the, the emotions we talk about most, and then romantic love. And so when you talk about those things, it's harder to understand the um, adaptive functions, I think. Yeah, good. Um, in, in the few minutes we have left, do you want, can you remember um, um, Jules Panksepp, who's a neuroscientist uh, on the West Coast, I believe, right? I don't know if he's in San Francisco. or He's in Oregon. He's in Oregon. Uh, he was sharing some very interesting work, which I'm... I'm not sure I can remember exactly. Maybe you have a better memory on it. But it was, he's having rats um, observe other rats. Uh, Are they trying to solve a problem or they're in pain? And he's looking to see uh, what kind of, what's empathy like in the brain of these rats as they observe uh, conspecifics or other rats. Can you remember this experiment he's doing? I can't remember exactly. I just do know, I do know that he's, he wants to bring this, he wants to bring the, the question to a head about mirror neurons and empathy. Ah, and what see. is the person sort of emotional contagion versus, you know, Duvall talks more about how do we 
conceptualize these things and sympathy and that that level. I think it's something something's going on there, but I, I really can't uh, okay accurately. His work is, uh, I think, just taking shape in the lab, and even at that point he was sharing stuff that uh, was just brand new data. They were trying to track through the sort of laser, uh, sort of genetic uh, um, laser technique, you know, of, of tracking what, where's the activity happening during certain behaviors, and of course it's, it, can, it can be quite precise now compared with things like uh, electrical stimulation of the brain. Um, yeah. But I think that's exciting. Yeah, and I, I think it's a good it's a good uh, illustration of the fact that biology is messy and complicated, and if you want biology to say emotion is X, then you're going to have a hard time, and that biology, as we've we've ta both talked about and you've written books about this, biology is a is a complicated, changing field that um, understands multiple levels, and neuroscience also neuroscience is extremely complicated. We had a, a good opportunity to speak with neuroscientists at this mm -hmm. conference to informally and to get a better understanding of the uh, the nature of cell biology, the nature of synaptic and membranes and all these kinds of things mm -hmm. that they we it's very easy for us to talk about it like and have these simple graphs and say well that's what just then that shoots off that shoots there but then when you get into the physics of it 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 is um it, it is not a, a one sentence. Yeah. It's not a one sentence definition, and it's not like you can change your synapses. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's not available. <laughs> That's not available for, for people who are doing this work. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's a sort of cleft between um, scientific analysis and self help uh, analysis. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think there's a. There are people who are trying to um, apply these um, sort of artificial intelligence models and computational models, and they think of the brain and the body. They know it's a wet, you know, <laughs> system, but in a way, they still abstract the hell out of it so that it's. They think of it like a Laplacian Laplace's demon is a Laplacian system, where if you know the sort of conditions at time one, you're going to know. You're going to be able to predict the conditions at time two and three, and, and that basically it's kind of a Newton. They're thinking of a Newtonian computational system, but when you talk to these guys who are doing the neuroscience, they're like, "Whoa, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's nothing like the synapse doesn't even like even the way the synapse is communicating. You know, uh, the neurons communicating with another neuron is so incredibly uh, complex, um, and it." Maybe all that stuff will reduce to a Laplacian system, but it's t people are making that assumption and that reduction in a very facile way. And I think it was just an eye-opening experience to spend time with, you know, biologists who are really working. We met these folks who were just doing, like, intensive uh, analysis on, like, the vagus nerve and, and so forth. And it's just remarkable to see uh, where we're at, what we do know. It's pretty impressive, and what we don't know is just really amazing as well. It's just huge territory, right? And it's it's kind of nice that we're ending on talking about the incredible complexities of the biological bottom layer that we're saying as these are these sort of these are emotional founts, and then we're contrasting with this incredible layer of cultural complexity right. up at this thing. That right. so some people want to focus on this, some people want to focus on this, and. Um, that's just the state of things. That's just that's how things are. You know, I, I think that uh, answers, the, the notion of answer, uh, fits into more of a uh, ethical questions of of what's meaning, what's real, what's true, and how do we hang some? Where do we hang our coats in this existential, you know, uh, situation? But it doesn't mean that there's going to be an answer, or that the answer is going to be understandable by a single mind or something like that. Yeah. Okay, good. On that note, let's hang up our coats and uh, <laughs> let's hang up this conversation. And uh, it's been fun as usual, so thank you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, we'll continue uh, another uh, podcast in the near future. Okay.